Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. Um, during this pandemic, I've been entertaining myself as well as becoming more educated by having guests on my webinars. Um, we took a little break for a while, and I am so excited to be back because this is my third one. Now, this is number 80. Um, Ooh. Yeah, it's number. crazy. <laughs> And um, I, I'm back in the swing. I'm really enjoying having the webinars again. And so um, I'm just really excited. So if you have some ideas for guests, just email me at wendy at I'm I've got a lineup and Bob Belker will be back. I just got a message from him tonight, but his wife is still recovering. And so he needs a little more time for things to settle down, um, but he will be back. So we're looking forward to that maybe the end of the month. Um, tonight, my guest is Lauren. Uh oh, I forgot your last name. It's okay, Harmon. <laughs> Lauren Harmon. How could I forget that? I've been typing it all day. Lauren <laughs> Harmon from Colorado. And um, she's a, a good friend of Rachel Bellini's, which is how we first saw you in one of Rachel's webinars. <laughs> and You're worried about my hands. <laughs> well, when we found out you were feeling things, we all got so curious about what you were doing that I knew we had to have you as a guest. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you and thank you to Rachel for the connection. So, yeah. so Lauren, just give us some of your background because when I started reading, I realized you're also a rolfer, is that right? Yep. Cool. And um, so just how did you wind up doing what you're doing now? <laughs> um. The short version is I, I was a, a jumper rider. Um, I was working towards the intention of going Grand Prix. Um, and my horse and I unfortunately had a bad jump that led to her passing. And I was already very curious about uh, different ways of healing and helping the horses and I at that point in time like I only thought veterinary route was one of the ways you could go um, so I entered that path and in college I um, I injured my back in my sleep <laughs> and it was a uh, career ending injury um, for myself and it led me down this whole path of learning about movement and um, proprioception and all these things I never had to think about because I just could do it. <laughs> um, but after my back injury, I had lost a lot of coordination between my upper body and my lower body. And when I would ride, sometimes it would show up and sometimes it wouldn't. And often I, I couldn't walk when I would get off the horse. Um, oh, wow. So um, you, what, how old were you when you had this injury? I was 20. Oh, wow. Um, and you yeah. just woke up one day and... Yep. <laughs> um, I had herniated a disc in my back in my sleep. And we now know that it was probably... I, um, they think most likely that I have Erlos Downless Syndrome. So I'm very hypermobile in my body. That was my and, if you were hypermobile. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so most of my injuries have actually been in my sleep because it's the one time during the day where I can't consciously be aware of how I am in my body. Um, and that then led to a whole spiral of things. I got really sick. Um, I got an infection that took seven years to figure out what was going on. So by that point, my nervous system was going haywire. My whole body was just not working properly. I wasn't able to absorb nutrients. There's a whole host of things. So fortunately, I found an amazing team of people <laughs> that um, helped me not only learn, relearn how to walk and re-coordinate my body so that I could eventually get on a horse again and feel like I could do something, you know, I, I don't ride the same way I used to ride, but I love the way I ride better um, because I feel like I'm more in connection with myself and the horse. And... You know, and so many people think that hypermobility is a good thing, but it's not. <laughs> I can say it really, and for for riders, it's a really difficult thing. And what I what I see as an instructor is that a lot of people lock their body down, they lock their joints down to try and find stability when they're hypermobile, and that causes a whole host of other problems. Yeah, and if you don't have enough muscular strength, I fortunately I was an athlete. I was a gymnast and a runner, and I had all this muscle tone 
that um, even though I now know it was very out of balance, it helped keep my structure stable. Mm -hmm. And when I got injured and sick, I muscle wasted. I lost all my tone. So it completely destabilized um, my body. So I've had to learn from scratch how to bring that back, which yeah. was in itself one of the greatest gifts because it really helped inform my work. Um, and I start, rolfing was the one thing that helped me be able to move again and, and find connection. Um, Which I find so fascinating because I've had rolfing. Um, I had rolfing after I had the horse flip on me and break my hip socket back in 84. Um, I went from Traeger, which is this super gentle form of rocking, to mm -hmm. rolfing, which is this super deep. Um, so yeah. I find that fascinating that you would find rolfing given your hypermobility and your lack of muscle tone. But you know, um, well, um, yeah, and what I found was actually that there's a lot of different ways to work as a rolfer. Yes. And so <laughs> that is why, I and mean, that's what a lot of what we're going to talk about today, because rolfing doesn't have to be painful. And it doesn't have to be about a lot of pressure yeah. um, to be effective. I think it's evolved um, a lot in the past um, 40 years or so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So as we've learned more about fascia and the nervous system and how, um, you know, how the interrelationships really inform us, we can still work with the same principles that Dr. Rolf, um, who I'll talk about in this presentation, um, discovered, but in a way that's very gentle. I, I look like I'm just standing next to the horse a lot of times, <laughs> yeah. and I still consider my, my work rolfing. Um, I am, I have a background in cranial sacral as well, um, and rolf movement and different energy work, and so that does also influence. And then through my injuries and my own healing process, um, and what the horses taught me, that was also a big piece of it. So. Yeah, and you know, so often I think we come to our professions out of well, for me, certainly the same thing out of a really serious injury that it was like, there's got to be another way. And so, you know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. It's yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes a little extreme, but, um, you know, as you know, um, I do. <laughs> it is things, and that's kind of, you know, and in some ways I, I look at this pandemic as, as one of those things that is going to make us stronger. And while it seems so difficult right now and you turn on the news and it's, you know, not good news, um, but it is these times when we're forced into really looking at things and making decisions and choices and exploring and, and kind of figuring out what's right for us that we grow. Um, and so I know a lot of people are really struggling and hurting right now during the pandemic and aren't sure what they're gonna do and you know, what's the, yeah. You know, blah, blah, blah. But, but it is, it is an opportunity if we can look at it that way as a way of growth. Um, Definitely. And we just have to have a lot of compassion for ourselves and others right now. Yeah, for um, sure. Um, and just before we get started, the other thing that I thought of is, you know what I'm seeing in a lot of these warm bloods now is more and more hypermobility. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so the, there's, um, there's a Gumby-like quality, but it can be hot Gumby. And it's also not so easy to condition. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure that you can relate to a lot of the horses that we're seeing now, at least in the performance world, yeah. where we've been breeding this way. And it's not necessarily to the benefit of the horse in the end um, because of the challenges. It, it definitely, it makes it a lot harder for the horse to develop their posture in the way that we're used to things working. Um, because the tissue doesn't respond in the same way and changes to their environment, their emotional state trauma affect the system a lot more because it's way more porous. Um, and so we, there's an importance to really make sure that not taking them past fatigue um, or watching their fatigue levels because if they go into fatigue, they're going to go into compensation really fast. Yeah. Um, and really focusing on um, micro movements, which I really think the pad, the, the surefoot pads are incredibly helpful for this because I, I, from my perspective, they do help with that gentle stabilization of the system and informing the body of where you are in space in a really gentle way that's not 
um, yeah, for, you know, depending on where the horse is at. And we'll talk about that. Like we always want to make sure we're meeting the horse where they're at. We're monitoring, we're titrating anything we're doing with them. But I really feel that they're, the pads are very helpful for informing that those little postural pieces to um, show up differently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we definitely have to work with them different. <laughs> I, I think I have a cat that I have, I'm going to keep talking. I'll be right okay. back. <laughs> Um, okay, so I just so everybody has a little more about my background. Um, I went to the Rolf Institute, which is now the Dr. Ida Rolf Institute. It's been renamed. Hopefully I quoted that correctly. Um, it's in Boulder, Colorado, and there are also locations all over the world. Um, I'm a certified advanced Rolfer from there. Um, so what that means is you do your basic training and then after three years and a certain amount of continue, hello kitty. <laughs> you know, there was a cat and here she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, after a certain amount of years of training, you can go and get your advanced certification. Um, my fascination is very much from the energetic movement, um, side of rolfing. Um, and so I, that's what I've gone on to study. Most of my continuing education has been more from the movement perspective um from looking at the original blueprint the energetic side of things um how can we get in that like nuanced finesse place um and really work with the subtleties to create a, a big impact but in a way that's much that i feel is easy for the horse to integrate um and take forward um and not feel like they're like oh my gosh what just happened <laughs> Um, so, oh, um, while I was away, I didn't know, did you talk about Ida yet? Not yet. I just talked about the, the Institute and kind of the process for the training. Um, and I never had any intention of working with people. <laughs> I just went there to I work with that feeling. I <laughs> that feeling. That was um, like, never going to yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I, I loved my work with people. So I had a practice for seven years with people. Um, and I, um, in my journey ended up having to have heart surgery. And after that surgery, it was just very clear to me that I needed to shift where I was focusing more to the horses. And that was always my intention all along, but it just became clear like this was the, the time to do so. And I thoroughly enjoyed my people clients and um, I learned so much from them and I'm, I'm very grateful for them. Lauren, can um, I ask you how old you are? I'm 33. <laughs> You have had a lot of life in 33 years. I have. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing um, what's thrown at us, isn't it? Right. And I, I, you know, it's, there's been some moments where I was like, I really wish that didn't happen, but I've learned so much from it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So now my, my, my relationship with working with people is that I, similar to, I think your work, Wendy, is that. I do sessions with horses and riders together um, where they receive body work in motion together. Um, and so that is a part of my practice as well as my sessions with horses. And I do work with other animals as well, um, depending on the day. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, like I said, you've packed a lot in in many ways in a, yeah. in a few short years. Um, yep. <laughs> I'm hoping that you're past that part. That's like for me, I'm hoping I'm past that part that we can just like kind of, you know, go, okay, we learned our, our lessons. Can we just keep learning now? Yeah, I, I do feel like I'm stepping into a, a new uh, phase of things. So I'm excited to see what happens next. <laughs> so, right. so you have uh, a, a PowerPoint, right? I have a PowerPoint. So bear with me all while I share this. <laughs> yeah, practice screen share. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully it'll, the computer gods will be in my favor today. <laughs> you know, so many of my guests are unfamiliar with Zoom and screen sharing. And so it's, you know, it's a little bit of bearing with them. And, and what you have to realize is that the screen actually, like when I looked at the Facebook Live I did yesterday with Tammy, we're on the opposite side of the screen. So it's not always so clear and direct of how, how Zoom is processing the images and um so t it's a little bit of a challenge for all of us so it is and it's you know it's uh um just hoping that the uh technology is on our side <laughs> i think so i think you've got it okay 
We'll see how this goes. Um, and I did, hopefully, uh, we, there is a video, um, and I shared the sound. So if anyone can't hear the video when we get to that point, just let me know, and I'll see what I can do. So um, today we're going to be talking about fascia as a medium for enhancing perception. And I love sunflowers, so I chose this as the background of this, also because sunflowers have um, a sacred geometry and fractal pattern to them, as, and as does fascia, so I thought it was appropriate. Oh, cool. <laughs> so. And then I just wanted to start off by my why is that it's my intention and my hope to help the horses return to embodiment from a place that's informed by their soul and their spirit and their original blueprint and not a place that's conditioned or compensatory. Um, so they can experience their body to the fullest in their environment and have a really good relationship with us um, and with touch. Because a lot of times horses, if they've had any type of trauma, touch is not safe. Um, and so it's really important to me to help horses realize that touch is a safe thing. Um, and in return, they help us do the same. So. Mm. <laughs> um, I'm just going to move our. I was going to say. <laughs> yep, that's okay. Here, I'll move this out of the. Let me know if, if we're blocking anything. Anyway. No, we're good. Um, so, Dr. Ida Rolfe was this amazing woman who was a pioneer in the world of fascia. She, um, in the 1930s, was getting curious about there must be better ways to facilitate health and wellness in, um, in our bodies. And so that's when she started exploring things. Um, she traveled to Europe and she studied things like osteopathy and yoga and homeopathy and physics and all these different things, really holding this curiosity of how does the body come into a place of more health and order. Um, and she was way ahead of her time. I mean, she was just, she was a powerhouse woman in a time period when that was not necessarily commonplace. Um, she had a PhD in biochemistry and she worked at the Rockefeller Institute. I mean, she was just amazing. Um, where where and, was she from originally? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I hadn't even thought about that, but um, I didn't know what country she originated from. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I will look that up and let you know. Because <laughs> it's not in my, I know I knew at one point, but I'm not remembering in this moment. <laughs> that's fine, no problem. Oh, it's all good. Um, and her work with fascia um, and this understanding and organization of the body became later known as Rolf Instructional Integration. Um, which is a mouthful, so most people will just say Rolf thing. Um, the reason why you'll hear both, though, is because if you didn't go to the Rolf Institute, um, if you went to Tom Meyer School or the Guild or any of the other um, structural integration schools, they will call themselves a structural integration practitioner versus a Rolfer. Essentially, it's the same, same school of thought, just um, schools that had branched off from the original Rolf Institute. Um, and the guild. Um, so it's a way of bringing the body back into better balance and gravity. And essentially what that means is that when the fascia is able to slide and glide like silk ribbons, force of gravity can go through us with ease and we can have nice posture and it just feels so much easier to be in our bodies. Um, and so that's what her, the intention of her work was. Um, and I put this in here for you. Wendy about Moshe Feldenkrais because he received a session or maybe multiple sessions from Ida. So I thought you'd think that was fun, but he talked about when Ida Rolf integrates structure as nobody else can, she improves function and Rolfing was revealing and an unforgettable experience. So, well, and, and the thing that was so fascinating, and I think we see this in other periods of time, that we had Ida Rolf, Moshe Feldenkrais uh -huh. and, and um, FM Alexander all mm -hmm alive at the same time all exactly. from different perspectives um, um, um alexander was an orator so he would go on stage and speak and he lost his voice so he studied himself in mirrors and figured out the primary control of the head and neck ida was looking at fascia and structural integration and feldenkrais was looking at functional integration or movement integration 
and and so you have to think that at that time there and there were others mm -hmm. there were so many others amy oh. cochran and just so many others right that this was sort of one of those moments in time when these thoughts were coming through really strongly and everybody was kind of coming from their own perspective and and it shifted the way we look at the body yes and and it's been carried forward now well that was in the 30s so we're looking at um what 70 years 80 years right because feldenkrais yeah. was just before world war ii um and so it, i it must have been an amazing time um with all these people coming up with these ideas and sharing them and you know combining it with yoga and osteopathy and physics mm -hmm. and this feldenkrais was an engineer so um i find it so fascinating that they were all there at that moment in time yeah, there is this just like this, you know, culmination of all this amazing information coming out. And it was a new paradigm of what it meant to experience your body in the world. And I just think that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Um, and we're just now sort of, you know, refining and seeing, and with Feldenkrais Method, you also see a lot of different schools of thought um, branched out. Because when you have a, a, a great thinker like Ida Rolf or Dr. Feldenkrais, no one can recreate that individual. It's how we interpret the work that they've created. But the eddies and the ripples and the, and the you know, options and the choices, it, it all stems from that, you know, tree, from that trunk. Absolutely. And that's why no practitioner will, will be like any other practitioner. My work is not going to look like any other Rolfer's work. And that's great. Right. Because it's, it's my own life story and experience that's informing how I'm showing up for that person. And, and my hope is that every other practitioner feels that they have the freedom to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads me to the, the picture I chose of Ida Rolf was her working with this little boy because Rolfing has a bad reputation for being excruciating. <laughs> and I just want people to know like, one, that work is very powerful. And two, there are other options <laughs> and other ways of, of working uh, as a rolfer. Um, and that's very much the place, the, the, what, I have, what I'm going to present today is very much from a place of movement and energy. And it's going to be very, very gentle. Um, so it's something that you can do where you know you're going to do, there won't be any harm um, as a result. Because oh, somebody has an answer for us, son. A biofound oh. in search. He's born in the Bronx, New York in 1896. Okay. I thought it was New York, but I didn't want to misquote. Oh. <laughs> Bernard Rolf, who was a civil engineer and who had built docks and piers on the East Coast. Thank cool. you, Jerry. That was awesome. I love when my folks help us out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I appreciate all the, the help. You know, with, with um, you know, Rolf and all these different movement and with fashion, there's so much information and there's so much information coming out each day that, you know, this is just going to be a piece of the puzzle. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, great. cool. Okay. Oh, she's a librarian, so she couldn't resist the research. Awesome. Oh, I love it. Well, feel free to help along. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, okay. So let's see. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that it it's it's kind of about bringing our body back to more of a baseline um, because it's helping remove any remove or restore. Um, the body so that these compensation patterns that we no longer need or no longer are serving us are able to, you know, they, 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 they serve their purpose and they, we learn from them, but they don't need to stick around. <laughs> so, okay. Um, are our faces in front of this? I apologize. I'm, no, I'm, I've got you over and it's my screen that's recording. So, okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. Then I'm going to move this around as need be. <laughs> okay, perfect. perfect. Okay. So um, we're going to start talking about fascia, and the image I picked here is actually a spider web with water on it. Um, and the reason why I chose it is because fascia, when it's healthy, is incredibly um, liquid. <laughs> and I just love this image of the spider web with the droplets because it's it's very similar to, to fascia in the living body. And I know in a lot of the other webinars. Um, strolling under the skin was referenced. So again, I highly recommend people um, check that out. It's a, a video that shows um, fascia and living tissue because when we see fascia, by the time you get to a place of 
dissection, it's not the same quality as it is in the, the living body. Um, and so I think it's really important to realize that it's this beautifully hydrated, um, mostly liquid tissue. Um, and there, it does have different densities depending on if we're looking at the more macro or micro level. Um, so fascia. <clears throat> it's in every part of our body, um, everything from the cellular level to um, big sheets of fascia. And if you were to take away everything else in the body, you'd still have an outline of every bone, blood vessel, nerve, um, muscle fiber left. So it encapsulates everything and there's no start or end to it within the body, which is a beautiful thing because this interconnectedness is what gives it potency um, for being able to create change. Um, and it's very interconnected with the nervous system as well. And it's about creating structure in the body and structure create, helps facilitate function. So we need our fascia to be really healthy for our body to be really healthy. And when it's in a healthy state, like I mentioned, it's gonna be in more of a liquid um, state so that the tissues can slide and glide like silk ribbons. That's just like my favorite analogy because it just, I don't know, it feels really good to like feel into that. <laughs> um, and let's see. Um, and now a lot more information is coming to light around fascia. So each day we're learning more and more about how it influences our structure, um, how it relates to the nervous system, how it responds to contact. Um, because in, like we mentioned earlier, initially people, it, it was thought that it only could respond to a lot of pressure and that's really not the case. Um, and so I just love that there's so much more knowledge coming out of the different research that's being done and practitioners exploring a relationship with it and seeing what they find. So, um, fascia allows us to have tensegrity in our bodies. And this is another term. There's some really great webinars that you've already done, Wendy, where, you know, people have talked about fascia. So I'm just trying to add new information um, to those ones. So I highly recommend people go back and watch the other videos. Um, the tensegrity is something that came up um, and it's really important because when we have a healthy level of tensegrity in the body, we have a tension, but we also have integrity. And like we talked about with the hypermobility, you do want a certain level of tension in the body to have stability and this ability to be upright in gravity and have ease of lift and grace. Um, and that tensegrity is one of the properties that allows that to happen. And I chose this picture because I just thought it was so cool how this person was like, like, like pushing themselves into this space and like fully engaging their whole body to, you know, um, to create that, that movement there. So <laughs> it's a good, good example of tensegrity. <laughs> um, so let's see. Okay. So then we, when we don't have enough tensegrity in the body, or if we have too much hypermobility, then you're going to see lack of function, more and more compensation, and it takes a lot more energy to be in your body. So that's why we need a certain amount of tension because it allows us to, to be upright in gravity. Um, I can speak for the hypermobile side of things that when there's not enough tension, I have to work a lot harder to be up in gravity and it can be very um, exhausting. And um, there's such a drastic difference when this is in a really healthy space and when it's in a more um, lack of integrity space. Um, and our horses, like we've talked about, can have this be um, an occurrence as well, so. And so when we're talking about this, we're looking at like bones and ligaments. Yes, oh yes. Part of that, that stability where the muscles are part of the mobility, right? Yeah, yeah, so we, we want the, um, when we kind of, we're going to be getting into sort of the structure of the fashion in the next slide, but the um, tendons and ligaments are essentially just thickened fascia. And they are very, very, very strong. And they're meant to create stability in our body. 
Um, and so that, that the muscles can then help us have um, movement. But if there isn't that stability, then the muscles, like they're, they're, they're not gonna be able to function the way they're supposed to. And we're gonna have areas, what we, almost where they're offline or areas of darkness so the body will start to reorganize and skip over places that aren't showing up. And that's how we get compensation patterns. Mm -hmm. Good description. Um, but yes, yeah, so a great point with the, the, the bones being part of that and the, the soft tissue and the bones being in this like relationship of tension and integrity. Yeah. So this is something that people can do um, at home. All you need is an orange or some type of citrus. <laughs> um, an orange is a really great simplified example of understanding how um, interconnected fascia is in the body and how throughout the body it is. So if we look at an orange, the pulp of the orange is kind of like um, a muscle fiber. And then it's going to have a layer of tissue around that. And then that will have more little sections of pulp. And then they have a layer to shear on that. And then we have our sections of the orange. That's like our individual muscles. And then we have how the, um, the, those each sections are attaching to them, like the skin and the outer layers and the more superficial layers of the orange. <laughs> and so if anybody wants to do this at home, it's a really fun experiment. Um, what you do is get an orange and just kind of get a sense of like what it feels like before you really influence it in any way. <laughs> Most likely it's gonna feel a little bit um, almost like dry in texture, it'll feel a little bit harder. Um, so I really enjoy, because I do this for classes that I teach, finding oranges that have scars on them because you can actually change the scar on the orange. <laughs> oh, wow, okay, I've got some oranges in the fridge, now I wanna run out there. And it's super fun. <laughs> um, and so what you'll do is, um, to just basically fascia, when we start to connect with it, whether it's on an energetic level or through, um, through skin to skin or skin to orange contact, <laughs> um, you start changing the quality of the tissue. And so the orange helps us have a, a felt sense of that so that we can already have that sensory input in our hands. And so what you'll wanna do is then just start to gently roll the orange around in your hands or roll it on the table and you don't, don't have to use a lot of force just start kind of playing with it and then just notice how the qualities of the orange change and you can also um sort of like squish it in different directions to see okay like does it have more give this way or you know <laughs> and just notice how it changes over time and that's essentially what happens in our bodies when the fascia is more hydrated we get more um hydration we get more movement we get more of that sliding and gliding and um in one of the classes i did one of the students, um, they, can, they cut open the orange and the orange on the, will be on the right side was the one that was more hydrated. So you can see how like luscious it looks and how hydrated it is. And if we were to, um, we could separate things out much easier from that side of the orange. You could differentiate the tissue. Whereas the one on the left looks more dry. It doesn't look as like vital. It doesn't look like, I wouldn't want to eat the orange on the left as much as the orange on the right. <laughs> um, and so it's just a cool way to get to kind of feel um, a simplified version of what fascia changing in the body feels like underneath your hands. Um, and that way, when you go to work with the horse, you kind of have an idea of like, oh, this is the tone that I'm starting out with. Here's the tone that might like happen as a result. Um, and it just starts training your hands to feel um, changes as well. So it's just kind of a fun experiment. <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, and then again, so scar tissue is essentially unorganized um, connective tissue. And so you can also take the orange and work on a scar. And you'll actually, um, we've actually had times where the, there'll be like a rivet in the orange and it will completely flatten out, which is similar to what can happen um, in the body. Scars can go away. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to know that like the, the body is always trying to move towards health and order if we give it the right um, support. And so just because there's scar tissue doesn't mean it can't change. Um, I'm living proof of that. I had back surgery 
um, before I knew what I knew now, <laughs> or before I know what I know now. And um, my, through a lot of work, my, my scar is basically gone. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's not, you don't have to use a lot of contact. Like it's, you can work with it in a very gentle way um, to reorganize the tissue. So I just put that out there that it's possible. <laughs> um, okay. So. Well, I've had scar work done that's made a big difference. I, I probably need a lot more because I, it's a pretty hefty scar, but um, it, yeah, it, it really, I, and, and the quality of the person working on it is so important because I had one person and the scar would change and smooth out and everything in somebody else and it was like on fire. Um, so it, it is really a lot about finding the right, um, the right technician. If you will. That is so important. And, you know, really finding somebody who resonates with you is really important. And then I also encourage people that, you know, a lot of times there's trauma at, related to the scar. So working with the energetic and emotional side of it as well, um, can really support the changes, um, in us as a whole, but especially in scar tissue. Mm. Um, so I, that was, that was a big piece, um, for me in conjunction with getting support through body work. So, um, so yeah, go, go play the oranges. It'll be fun. <laughs> As somebody said that oranges are the unsung hero of the medical world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, and then have it, you get a nice organic one, and then you have a really good juicy snack afterwards. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's kind of fun to do is a comparison. If you take one that you didn't really um, mess with, and then take the one that you got to play with, it'll be much easier to peel the one um, that you played with versus the one that you didn't touch um, mm. because of the hydration. So, um, okay, so more spider webs. <laughs> <laughs> um, fascia communicates so fast in our bodies. Um, and this is a, it's a, it's a protection mechanism. It, fascia serves us to, because compensations do help protect us. When we sprain an ankle, when we have an injury, the body needs to be able to instantaneously reorganize so that we can protect whatever that injury is. Um, and so what it will do if over time that compensation stays, it'll start laying down more and more tissue to reinforce how the forces are going through the body to protect whatever it's protecting. Um, and as long as there is a, um, source for needing that compensation, it will be very hard for the body to let go of that compensation, no matter the, the body work. So it's really about getting to the root source of things. And the other thing is that whatever movements we do on a regular basis, our fascia will start to reinforce those movements, which is a really good thing for our farriers because the position they have to be in um, on a regular basis, their body needs to be able to adapt and get stronger to stabilize them in those positions. So that's just an example. <laughs> um, but any, any movement we do on a regular basis, your body will organize to support that movement. So be very conscious of the movement you're doing on a regular basis. <laughs> um, and if you wanna feel how fast your body can change, you can take a walk around whatever space you're in safely and see where your body's at in the moment. And just kind of check in. And then take a walk where you slightly brace one of your ankles and just notice what happens in the rest of your body just from that slight brace and then shake it off because you don't want to let that stick around <laughs> but it's just another way to see how fast it changes in the body and i'm very kinesthetic and sensory so i like to feel things and and explore things through um you know from, from being able to feel it because then it helps me understand what the horse or whoever i'm working with may be experiencing um, and then that's not to say that I'm taking on their pattern, but just that, um, we can, we can enhance our ability to perceive, um, when we have an understanding how things relate in the body. Um, again, I cannot, uh, put this out there enough. We want it to slide and glide. 
um, differentiate. And the reason why I chose these two pictures of the spider web is because if you look at the one above, it's had to reinforce the web on the bottom right hand side. It's more dense there based on the forces that are being placed upon the spider web. Whereas the one below is a little bit more balanced, not symmetrical, just a little more balanced. We're not necessarily looking for symmetry. We're just looking for how are things relating in a balanced way. We're not symmetrical beings. Our organs aren't symmetrical, but we can find balance within um, our systems. So, so. You know, and, and that idea of modeling, I th when I first was teaching writing, in order to understand what I had to do to help my student, I would just model the position. Exactly. And then, and then let it go. And I'd do that a few times. And then I knew what to do because I had already done it. I'd already been in that position and then felt the change that has to occur to, to let it go. Um, I find modeling quite a fascinating and very useful technique. It's, it's very useful. And there's a lot of ways to um, be able to perceive what is happening for another being. And modeling is a, is a great way to um, try things on and then be like, okay, I don't need to hold on to that. But now I understand mm -hmm. that you're taking a walk in their shoes for a moment to be like, okay, what is it like to be in your body? And how can I help support you in that process? Right. And we can model our horse's bodies. I mean, we can get on all fours, but you can also just model it. Um, just think about leaning over a little bit and say, tilting the head or tightening the side of the neck or leaning on a shoulder and then feeling how that affects movement. And then again, exactly. yeah, let it yeah. go. So it's a great, thank you for bringing that up. It's a really awesome My pleasure. And just to expand on that, one of the cool things is, is that the more we are aware and perceiving in our bodies, we can help the, you know, we, we can understand, okay, the horse is having this pattern and most likely we're doing something similar or mirroring or, you know, contributing or in the same exact pattern. And so because we're being conscious about changing a pattern, we can breathe into that space. We can bring awareness into that space. And I, over and over again, I will see the horse change in that exact same space. And it's just so much fun because one, it just helps increase the relationship, but also it's a way we can support our horses in a really, gentle way that's just also helping us feel better so um yeah so it's just it's a, it's a beautiful way to connect with them um, okay so a lot of times unless there's been an acute injury or a specific trauma that we are very you know we're aware that happened or um is an ongoing source of pain um, where the pain shows up is not usually the root cause. And it's just usually the thing that's talking the loudest. <laughs> um, and that is because of this interconnectedness. So what you can see in these two pictures here is I simulated a restriction <clears throat> by twisting my shirt to show, okay, there's a restriction in the right side of my abdomen above my pelvis. Um, and as you can see, it's pulling on my shoulder. It's bringing it forward and down and it's creating a twist in my spine. And um, a lot of times how that's gonna be perceived in the body is my shoulder hurts <laughs> or the back of my neck hurts or somewhere higher up in that pattern. And the reason why I want to make sure there's an awareness around this is because if we were to just keep working with the shoulder Yes, we'd get some relief, but we wouldn't necessarily get a, a whole systemic change in the body. Um, so where we would need to work would be more where my right hand is twisting the shirt. And then the shoulder would be like, oh, I have space. I can breathe again. I'm like, all is well. And yeah, you may have to address the shoulder a little bit, but um, it, it's most likely going to go back into a place of ease more often than not from working at the, the root cause. Um, and so because fascia is this interconnected thing, when we feel into a horse's system, we can see, okay, where is that pattern going through their entire body? And then where in that pattern do they have the most capacity for change? 
and what place is going to have the most influence on their whole body. And that can take a little bit of exploring different things. Um, there are ways to kind of um, shorten that process, and that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> but um, just know that you want to kind of check in and see, okay, what has the most capacity to change? Where can change the most? And if you're working in an area for a portion of time and it doesn't feel like there's a lot of shift happening, give yourself permission to go somewhere else. It's totally okay. <laughs> Um, cause if you just hang out in that same place, it's just going to get really sore. <laughs> right. Um, and you're missing out on a greater opportunity from my perspective. So, so, so how long do you typically like work in an area before? I, I mean, I know it's a feel thing and it's hard to put it. Yeah. Time. Say for somebody who's just starting out and they go into a spot and they're there, you know, for a minute or two minutes or five minutes. I wouldn't be more there more than five minutes or less, unless it feels like there's something really potent there that you just like, you know, it's, it's, it's percolating. <laughs> but, so you but can it, feel that there's something cooking or something yeah. going on, you can hang out longer. But if it feels just like you're just sitting there for five yeah. minutes, it's like go somewhere else. And I would just go somewhere else because the tissue engages with you. I mean, it wants to be like talked to. <laughs> yeah. And if that area doesn't want to engage with you, it's not something else needs to shift first before that can change. And the body's intelligent. It knows how it needs to go into organization. Like I can see the shoulder is not in an ideal place, but something else might need to change before that shoulder can come back into balance. Right. And if I get fixated on, no, the shoulder's in the wrong spot, like I may be missing a, a more potent place to touch that will have a greater influence on the whole. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of like um, with the sure foot pads, it kind of, you know, when the horse won't pick up its foot, it's like, just go to another foot because clearly that's not the avenue in. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's a great way to think about it. And maybe I should talk about that more with sure foot about how the body's giving us the direction. It's inviting us into somewhere where, not where we think we need to go. And so often it's like, you know, it's hard to get people to say, just just listen to where they want you to go, not where you think you should go. But yeah, yeah. And it, totally. And it's kind of refreshing because it's like, I don't have to know everything to be able to help this horse. Yep. I can just do the best I can to listen and be present and, you know, show up and try to meet them where they're at and try to connect with the places that are going to make the most influence. Yep. So, um, okay. So I am incredibly grateful that they have started mapping the fascial lines because when I started this work, that wasn't a thing. <laughs> um, we had, you know, we had it for people and, and, um, you know, there's been a lot more research done for people, but when I started this work there, it wasn't a thing for horses. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that that's being done. And I just want to also highlight that those fascial lines help inform our hands, but it's not necessarily how the pattern is going to present in the horse's body. Um, it gives us an idea of relationships and um, how things connect to one another, but if the horse has a scar that runs across multiple um, fascial lines, it may not show up on just one particular relationship. Um, so it's important to learn and connect to these patterns, but know that you can also feel into the system, feel what layer the patterns are um, influencing and work with it from that space as well. Again, I am incredibly grateful for the work that's being done. I, I don't want to discredit that. I just want to bring this other awareness because um, compensation I mean, patterns don't necessarily follow the rules. <laughs> I, I think that's where, you know, when we look at all of this stuff, like even just the basic anatomy of the horse, you have the, you have the technical and the technique, but then you have the art of it. Yes, it's definitely an art form. <laughs> And it, and it helps to know a certain amount of technique and it helps to know a certain amount about structure that yes. those that are really excel at what they do take it not at the technical level but into the artistic level and that's a question of being present and feel and exactly I'm going to say here is it's it's important to know that there's these fascial lines and to know that they have connections and 
and that they're being mapped so that we can understand things. And then there's always the individual who has their uniqueness yeah. and we have to honor that. Yeah, well, one in, in dissection, well, if you go into dissections, things don't know, I mean, bodies are not yeah. identical. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's, I love the echosoma ladies because they keep coming up with, and look at this skeleton that is like, it's got an extra this, or it's missing that, or, you know. And Absolutely. This is yeah. So remember, you're working with a unique being, and let those connections inform your hands. And then also just let yourself go into the space of like, okay, I'm present with you. I'm just going to feel into this, and I'm going to see what's showing up. So... I have a very demanding cat. Keep going. I have, to, I have not been listening, okay? Okay. <laughs> what did I miss? Okay. Um, so Wendy left at the perfect time because now I'm going to talk about Sherpa pads and fascia. <laughs> um, maybe I'll, I'll wait for her to come back for a moment. <laughs> um, We're ruled by our animals. Yes. <laughs> You had good time because I was just getting to Sherpa pads. So I'm like, I don't want to talk without you here. <laughs> yeah, nope, here I am. <laughs> um, okay, so I am grateful because I've had, I have, I just recently in the last couple months actually got my full set of the Sherpa pads. Fortunately, I have clients that have them, so I've gotten to play around with them. And um, I've watched a lot of the, you know, other things that you've put out there in the past and I just loved the idea of it because from the way I work it just like created a whole new set of options <laughs> um, and so with the surefoot pads what I have found is that it gives the horses a new option for how to be in gravity because when we're working with people or other animals we can put them in different positional strategies to help create change. With the horses, we can to some extent, but we're still, they're still gonna be on, you know, in general, occasionally I have horses lie down like, cause they want to during sessions, but in general, they're gonna be standing for their session and, you know, in gravity in a certain way. And the pads have been this really beautiful um, opportunity to give them a different option in gravity. And what I mean by that is say you have a horse um, who I'd really love for them to have a different relationship between their shoulder and their rib cage. <laughs> and I have the horse and they're, they would, they're excited to stand on a pad um, on their front foot. And you can then just gently have your hand on, the, on either side of the shoulder and just feel and have them play with this idea that their shoulder has this freedom. Um, so it's just, it's just giving them another option for gravity, putting a little slack in the system so we have a little bit um, different tissue to play with. I recognize um, in some of the other webinars that there was a sense of not necessarily wanting to do any type of work when the horses are on the pads, and I totally honor that. What I'm talking about when the horses are on the pads is only if the horse can tolerate it, if it's in their highest good and in very small increments so that we're not overstimulating their body and creating a shutdown effect. Um, well, so you just really want to monitor the horses. Exactly. And I think it's, you know, I mean, if it's the first time the horse has ever seen the pads, introducing other things may be a too much. But once yeah. a horse has seen the pads, there you can introduce other ideas because they already know this thing now. And so yeah. now you can combine it and people do with other techniques. And I, I think that's the piece that it's always, I, um, I sometimes probably sound a little bit too rigid about it, but it's because I wanna make sure people when they're starting out don't overload. Right, we wanna keep the horses safe. I mean, that is first and foremost the priority. And so, yeah, this is, this is once the horse has been introduced to it. And like a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just, I'll bring the pads out, we'll just introduce them to it and we take them away and then just kind of like slowly, you know, add it in. And if the horse seems like they're really comfortable with it right away, then great. And you know, otherwise some horses need more time. It just really depends on the horse. Yeah. Um, my horse here thinks they're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is Hawkeye. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> and uh, we, we use the pads quite regularly. It's been really fun to play with for him. Um, he doesn't really get, he's not really a riding horse at this point in his 
life. So it's just a fun way for us to have something else to do um, in our time together. So. <laughs> so, so somebody's asked a question about um, how beneficial do you find it when owners use them like in between your visits? And oh, I think that's great. <laughs> yeah. And do you recommend that they that they have their own? So in other words, you kind of help them yep. figure out and start with some pads because I, what I yeah. keep seeing is it <laughs> at least maintains, if not enhances the treatments Absolutely. that professionals come in and do. Yeah, so what I've started doing, you know, after I, it was more after I got my full set and I got to kind of play with the different ones. So I got more familiar with them. Since then, I've been able to, you know, kind of be like, this is, based on what we know your horse is like and playing with my pads, this would be the ones I would maybe start off with for your horse. And then here's some things you can do with it. And then, you know, and so that they can incorporate it between times, because my intention is to empower the owner to be able to have ways to support their horse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm grateful to get to see them on a regular basis, but I also want to make sure they have the tools and the empowerment to feel like they can create change um, and support their horse. And I think the pads are so helpful for that because the, the horse can reorganize on the pad, you know, and the owner can hold space for them while they do that. Um, and like we talked about at the very beginning is it's, it's going to help increase those connections and keep rebuilding the system's awareness of where it is in space, mm -hmm. um, which can only help our horses. So, <laughs> Because the more their posture is strong and they feel confident in themselves, the more they're going to be able to show up for the you know what we do with them and um, the things that we hope that they want to share with us as far as whatever discipline of riding you know or not riding that we do. <laughs> right. So I, I understand the not riding part. I am not riding my horse right now. <laughs> yeah, he's super fun to ride. He's just had a lot happen to him. So he we meditate together. We read books together. We go on walks. It's great. <laughs> we have great a date night where you're taking your horse for a walk. There's oh, yeah. Value in it. Yeah. You learn so much. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and again, I want to reference Martina's website. It was wonderful. So just check out the other fascial um, websites because there's so much great information out there and it will just start really building a more complete picture of this puzzle that is the horse. <laughs> so. Um, yep. So Martina, the, you're referring to the two Martina Neardhart webinars that we've done. I can't tell you what the numbers are off the top of my head, but if you just look for Martina's name, in fact, if you go on the surefootequine.com uh, website and go to webinars, you can actually put her name in the search box. You can just put Martina and it'll pop up, which is. I, I think if you put fascia in two, it comes up. Yep. Um, I can't remember, but I believe so. Great. Um, so you can also, if you're doing a session, use the pads in between, uh, uh, giving them like you do a little bit of inner uh, intervention or contact or input, and and then give them some space or offer them a pad to stand on to kind of integrate what you just did, and then come on to the next piece. There's just as much grace and art in knowing where to put your hands and when to take them off, stand back, give the horse time to process. I've had horses that I'll maybe touch them two or three times in the beginning and then they'll process for a good 30 minutes for the rest of the session. You know, so it just really depends on the day, the horse, where they're at, what they need. Um, but giving them that space to process allows for them to integrate those changes and um, have a new sense of self. So new perception. And, and that processing time, it, you know, we're all so individual in that you'll mm -hmm. see um can you just describe like what it looks like when a horse is processing and how do you know when they're like coming back oh okay absolutely so again it'll be kind of different for every horse some horses are going to be more stoic so you have to watch them more carefully because they're they might like just close their eyes or um they might just you know the, the blink that um masterson talks about things like that where they're just going into, they're showing signs of relaxation, which also are the same signs as calming signals, which is a different thing and a different topic. But, <laughs> um, but they may start to yawn. They may start to um, close their eyes, lower their head, lick and chew, 
Um, you may start seeing them oscillating in their body, which is similar to what you'll see when they're on the pads, when you see that swaying happening. That can happen even just when they're in session and processing because they're having this new sense of the oscillation and this, um, the cerebral spinal fluid moving through their body and um, those connections reestablishing. Um, so a lot of times they'll go into a very peaceful place, almost like they're taking a nap. Mm -hmm. And they're very relaxed. And you may see um, them drop a hip or like, like I said, I've had horses that lie down and take a nap real quick sometimes. <laughs> Happened the other day, the horse, like, I just knew, like, they just showed me a picture that they were going to lay down. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Horse literally laid down for a moment, closed his eyes for a second, and then got back up and was ready to do some work. Oh, cool. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a more rare thing, but it does happen. Yeah. Um, so it really is individual to the horse. Uh, my horse, he will, like, if you just stand next to him relaxed, which is actually something we're going to talk about, he will go into a place of down regulation where he drops his head. He starts yawning. He closes his eyes. You'll kind of just see him like have this like movement like this going through his body. It really depends on the horse, though. Um, so, and there, oh, sorry. That's okay. I, you know, and somebody just brought up a comment that a lot of times we we tend to want to rush this, and yes, yeah. and there, and I do know that there's always this sort of balance between today I need to to not spend so much time because I've got to get on and ride, so I do work on my. <laughs> I do get my horse going because I could wind up standing there for an hour meditating with my horse and really not doing anything cardiovascular for the two totally. of them. Totally. So I, I think it's 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 something we have to feel through this balance between okay today I'm going to work on this or I'll do this for 50 yeah. minutes and then go on and ride because it really is important that we get the cardiovascular <laughs> in the fitness. Um, um, yeah, when they're when they're coming out of it, I mean, you sometimes. I mean, I've had horses where like, okay, I just have to gently invite them out of it because they're like, that horse is gonna just stay there forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then a lot of times they'll just like they'll do big cat stretches. They'll just they'll, they'll, you know they'll kind of start coming back into their space. Their eyes will open. Their eyes will look more open, but not like it's still a soft eye. And a lot of times it's bigger because they've had this nice release, so there's less pressure around the eyes. Um, and if you're going to do a little bit before you ride, just don't take them very deep in the process. Just do a small little contact or intervention or, and I use the word intervention just like, like, as you know, like how you're going to touch or how you're going to connect with them. Um, so that you're not going into that place of like, okay, full on deep meditation for an hour if you're planning on riding. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, I, now I have to go home and make dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> save, save the deep dive. For when you have no schedule basically <laughs> right. so and if you're doing it as a practitioner just know like you know you can help the horse if if it's if you you can help them kind of come back into the space um and a lot of times there is an end point to it you know they, they will come back and be like hey what's next or they might come back and they're like you know what i'm done that was enough mm -hmm. so and that's okay we have to give ourselves permission to not feel like we have to keep doing and doing and doing. Right. It, it's about being with them. And sometimes it doesn't take a lot to help facilitate a lot of change. Yep. So. And I think that one of the big pieces here too is, and we it's been mentioned in a couple other webinars about um, we're providing them a safe place where they can let down. Yes. Um, and if we take care of the, you know, um, checking the environment and making sure that, okay, I've got your back, I've got you protected, then it gives them permission to go into mm -hmm. that gap. And I've got a whole it. slide on that. <laughs> oh, great, okay, keep going. Sorry, we're kind of probably good. Oh, we're good, I'm just super excited because like that's exactly what, yeah, like, I, that is totally my jam. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so thank you so much for bringing that up. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's so important that the horse feels safe so they can let down, you know, because if they don't, if they don't feel safe, they're not going to go into that space. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it's, that's super important. <laughs> um, I, we've kind of already gone over, uh, how I became a horse rolfer, <laughs> but, um, the, the work changed my life and 
I knew I wanted to be able to work with horses in some way. And when I realized I could do it for horses, I was like, yes, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I hated school, like with a passion. I mean, I did it because I thought I knew I was supposed to, or I thought I was supposed to. And I loved learning, but I didn't like school. Yeah. <laughs> and when I went to the Rolf Institute, it was the first time, like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is where I am meant to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> um, because it just, it was just really, it just felt like it came naturally to me. So I was just super excited to get to explore it. And when I got to um, the Rolf Institute, I'm so grateful because I had an amazing group of teachers who helped me realize one, it's like we talked about, it's an art form. So you get to take it in whatever direction you want. And you can show up in this work in your authentic self. So it can, it can look different from everyone else in the room. <laughs> um, and through my own experiences and through the horses, I learned so much about how to work in this really subtle, um, gentle place and still create or help facilitate really deep change. Um, and that's with well, this next piece of, um, or these next section of slides is going to be about, there are so many ways to work with fascia. This is just a couple of them. Um, so I just put that out there. Like it would be so much time to go over every little way you could, uh, help facilitate health and well-being through the fascia. So I just want people to know, like, this is just a couple things. <laughs> um, and I, and there are things that people can do. Like you can go out with your horses after this and try it out and, oh. and feel really um, confident in that. So can we, we've had a question. She oh, said, yeah. um, do you believe that SI, and I assume that that's structural integration mm -hmm. and CST, which I'm not sure what CST is. Uh, cranial psychotherapy? Oh, right, yes. yeah, of course. Cranial are the same. I, I feel there is um, a huge similarity. I, I took um, Tracy's visionary, equine visionary craniosacral training. Tracy Broom. Yeah, Tracy Room, um, who you should also check out her webinar. <laughs> yeah, that was was really cool. um, she's amazing. Highly recommend her class. And the whole time I was in the class, I was like, this is what I do. Like, this is like, this is the way I work. <laughs> so for me, they are, I don't think you can, I, I don't separate it out because for me, it's, it, it's the same thing. Um, with that said, you, if you train as a craniosacral therapist and you go to most I, SI schools, they're going to be coming from a little bit different lens and perspective of how you're interacting with the, with the, um, the cerebral spinal fluid, with the rhythms of the body. Um, but most of the um, rolfers I trained with are also craniosacral um, so practitioners <laughs> um, because that's the movement. That's that primary movement um, in addition to what we're about to talk about. And so I feel they're, they're very interrelated. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so, and the cerebral spinal fluid is, is um, and the, the craniosacral therapy or work is facilitating this amazing shift in the fascia as well. So. Yeah, she says that's the way she feels as well, which is cool. Great. Awesome. Um, then thank you for sharing the questions because I'm not seeing them. So if I don't want to miss okay. anyone's question. That's my job. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, so I very much work from a place of, of listening and engaging with the fascia and the nervous system and helping make sure that the horse feels safe. Um, so that's what we're about to um, go into next. And I am so grateful because I got to study, I, I still continue to study with them. The world made it a little bit harder to do that right now. But um, uh, I have two teachers, one named Carol Agnesen and um, the other is a man named Hiro who's from Japan. And when I started studying with them, it just, I already worked like I work, but then I found people who had this like similarity to their work and I was like, yes, I'm not crazy. <laughs> there are more people like me. <laughs> and um, so this next piece of work I'm gonna share is um, from their work. And I'll be happy to share a link with you, Wendy, if you wanna put it in um, notes or something where people can access it. There's a beautiful article that they wrote that goes much more in depth to what I'm about to, to um, share. Yep. So I just put that out there. Um, in the description on the uh, webinar. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Um, so this is the lovely Carol. 
She is an amazing um, rolfer and movement practitioner, and her fascination is um, from a place of embryology. Um, and she's just an amazing human being. So this is a, a, a video of her talking about perception. Um, so I'm gonna play that and then we'll go on from there. Hopefully it works. <laughs> There's an Englishman who has written a lot, who grew up in South Africa, and he wrote a lot about the African Aborigines. And what he realized was that they could sense someone coming across the Kalahari because their perception in that space was so wide. What has happened is that we live in cities where that narrowing of our perceptual field has happened so that instead of seeing vistas and distances and trees and mountains I see the edges of buildings so in widening perception we begin to widen our scope of vision to a more of a peripheral scope rather than always a focused or foveal vision where it's right in front of me. That muscle that I'm looking at is right there. What if I widen my perception and begin to understand that what I'm really contacting is the whole person? But I can't do that if my eyes are really focused on one point. But if I can begin to cultivate this understanding that the person beneath my hands is this whole body and more, and by working with my own perception to include 360 degrees sense of the horizon behind me, then I'm in a much better place to treat the person as a whole and literally work not just in a part that needs fixing, but how this place may relate to a pain in the shoulder or neck. Perception can be cultivated that we don't have to stay in this little mind box that keeps us from an expanded view of our world. You know, I think that that um, when we start getting to the essence of things, we keep seeing these archetypes come up over and over and over. And this is one of the primary archetypes, I think, uh, um, that are, uh, well, I, I guess the other piece that I really resonate with this is I've been to Africa many times. <laughs> As <But> have I. <laughs> and you're, you know, when you get out there on the Mara and you're looking into Tanzania, mm -hmm. you're looking miles. It, totally. you know, I always come home with a really different sense of vision. It's, yeah. I didn't, that's right, you have been to Africa. Yeah. And there is something about being in space, like even out west in these areas where the horizon mm -hmm. is so far away and the vision is so much bigger than in our little spaces. Yeah. Absolutely. And just, I mean, like using Africa as an example, when you're in the Maasai Mara or when you're in um, the Serengeti or when you're in these places, the rhythm is different. Yeah. And it, it just gives us this deeper connection to the greater whole that is Mother Earth and in ourselves and how like we are not separate from one another. And um, yeah, it just gives us a, an expansion of our awareness and we can cultivate that awareness in our daily life. And it serves us on so many levels. I mean, everything we're talking about here, yes, we're talking about it from a bodywork perspective and how we can help our horses, but it, it applies to our daily life, you know? <laughs> so, um, so expanding our perception, being aware of our backspace, being aware of the world around us can change how we see it. And when I use the word see, I don't just mean with our eyes. I mean, it's like, how do we experience? How do we feel the world? There's um, some great books and articles about how there are so many more senses than we're taught in school. And the more we start to cultivate our senses, the more the world just like opens up. And that's what I hope we can help our horses with as well. So. <laughs> Oops, sorry, it's gonna try playing again. Ah. Okay. 
when you do the the space bar when the video is up, it like gets mad. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, so that brings us to fascia as a medium of perception. Because it's interrelating with every other part of our body from a cellular level to a macro level, it's a way, it allows us to have this an attunement of ourselves, to be aware of ourself and another and the place or the space around us. Um, and when the fascia is in the nervous system and the body has areas that are quiet or we have compensation patterns and where we can't fully experience our body in the most optimal way, it um, minimizes our ability to perceive. Um, so the more we can facilitate wellness in the fascia, the more we can perceive um, our world around us. And with horses, I feel this is so important because like we were talking about earlier, they need to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And when they feel they can perceive their world in a better way, but in a grounded way, then they're going to show up with more security and courage and, you know, be like, yes, let's go across that cross country course or whatever it is. <laughs> so, um, uh, these are just some questions that, sorry, I was blocking my screen. Um, that I just kind of like hold the intention of when, uh, I'm working with a horse. It's not to say all of them, but just kind of like, just kind of a checklist or some things to kind of remember is how can we engage the whole horse so they can have an expanded or enhanced experience of their body? Um, how can we facilitate more ease and letting go of residual tensions? Because even after the compensation pattern is gone, like they can still have this memory of this tension. Um, so I think the sure foot pads are huge for this residual tension piece. They, it's kind of like the um, what they, what Peter Levine talks about in waking the tiger when like a body has trauma and then wild animals will go and shake afterwards. <laughs> I think the sure foot pads allow our, um, domesticated animals who don't always know how to do that shake off pattern, um, mm -hmm. let go of that residual tension. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So, uh, where does the horse need to yield into their body so that they can be more fully embodied? And we're going to get into yielding in just a minute. <laughs> Um, what's already going really well for the horse? Like we don't, a lot of times we're like, okay, well, they're sore here, they're tight here, blah, blah, blah. I want to see like, what is really awesome already and how can we enhance that so it can inform the rest of the horse? Um, because it is so important Yeah, because we tend to get, again, that sort of uh, narrow vision on yeah. the things that we need to fix instead of the broader vision of what's going well. And exactly. I've often asked riders, I'll walk up to them and ask them what they do well, and they can't tell me. They um and ah. And I have like, similar experiences when I work with riders. <laughs> and then when I say, what do you do badly? Oh, it's a litany. They can just rattle it off. Yeah, they've yeah. got the whole list. <laughs> yeah. I, I find it fascinating. Um, yeah, so it's still it's, great, but fascinating. You know, just <laughs> how we have structured it so that they can immediately find fault instead of good. Yeah. So if we turn it on its head and we come, we start it off from the place of, okay, like what's already really awesome. Like you're already doing great. Like own the greatness. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then we can, we can work from a place that's resourced because if that's already going really well, like we know that's a strength and we can use that to resource the things that need help. Um, so where does the horse need, and that leads us to, okay, so where does the horse need more space, more expression in their body? When the body's more spacious, the cells have more space, so they vibrate more, so they can live longer and they can be more happy, basically. It's like the really simple version of that. When the body is tight and there's not enough space, it actually creates atrophy um, in the cells. So at a cellular level and a macro level, we need space so we can fully express ourselves. Um, let's see. We already talked about this. Where can we engage the horse where they have the most capacity to change and the most influence on the whole pattern? Um, because if they don't have capacity to change there, like I said, you can just, you'll be in, you'll be in that spot forever and nothing will happen. Um, and then we're looking at relationships. So we want to look at, okay, what is short and tight? What's 
long and tight? How are things connecting to one another? And the reason why I bring up that specifically is because you don't just want to work where there's tension. You want to see, okay, what is, what kind of tension is it? And how is it in relationship to the whole? Um, because if an area is already held long and tight and you go and make it longer, you're actually putting them more into their compensation pattern. Um, and what I mean by that is, I, I'm not, I don't want to stop the screen share, but I'm still going to share my body for a second. <laughs> if we, um, a good example of this is if we've been sitting at a computer all day and then we like go to our body worker and we're like, oh, I'm like, I have so much pain right here and I've got knots in my back and all that, which is, you know, can happen. Um, what can happen is if we're going to get like in this position and I'm going to exaggerate it <laughs> again, yay for hypermobility. <laughs> um, so we have this curvature here. And but this is where we're feeling the pain. It goes back to like, where's the pain? Where's the original source and where's the pain? A lot of times we'll feel the pain back here. If we work here, we're just gonna get more curvature. But if we release the front and we get this nice lift and expansion and the back can then be like, oh, I can return to neutral. Um, and the same thing goes for our horses. So it's just a matter of expanding the perception, looking at the relationships. Um, but that that's just one that I find is, shows up a lot. <laughs> so. Um, so before we even get out of our, if you have to drive to where your horse is or your horse lives at your house, before you go out, you know, go out the back door or whatever it is, um, or before you start a session, how we are showing up in ourselves will really set the tone for our interaction with our horse. Um, and so if you can take a moment to just take a deep breath, Maybe imagine you're exhaling down your legs, not the soles of your feet to help yourself ground or whatever resonates with you for grounding. You're going to have a much better experience with your horse <laughs> because you're already coming to a place where they're like, oh, you're in your body so I can be in my body. <laughs> um, it also lets them know they're safe because the more grounded you are, the more they know you're paying attention. The more that they know that you're um, not losing focus or, you know, paying attention, thinking about the to-do list you still have to do, things like that. And I get, we have lives where we may not always be able to be in that space all the time. Um, but I think it's especially important when we're going in to do any type of body work with them. Um, and this is especially important because our presence alone can already start facilitating change in the fascia. And we're going to get into that um, shortly. Um, and I also want to bring up that relaxation doesn't mean low energy. It just means that you're coming into a place of ease where you can move and be in a flow state or a parasympathetic state. It doesn't mean you have to be like tired or low or you can still be full of energy and be relaxed. Um, it'll be a grounded energy <laughs> versus a frenetic. So, um, and then this comes again back to this idea of rapport, um, wanting to make, make sure the horses feel like they're safe enough to be vulnerable with us. Um, they really like it when they have a sense that our insides and our outsides match. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is that like, you know, we're, we're not perfect. It's not, I'm not saying like you have to be in this perfect state anytime you're around your horse. It's just that they are reading our body language and our energy all the time. Um, and so, they know when something is going on with us. And when we're getting ready to do a session, if we can help ground ourselves so we are more congruent through our whole system, um, it's more likely to have a deeper impact. So, uh, okay. So the place of ease comes from um, Carol and Hero's work. And this is what I was mentioning where and I have a, um, the next slide will show pictures and I'm going to walk you through like how to do this. And it's really easy as the title, I guess says, <laughs> um, but it's Carol and Hero. They are, they're both rolfers. They both come from a, a movement perspective and Hero also has a um, PhD in biochemistry. So he comes very much from a, a cellular biology, um, lens as well. And in Japan, when they had earthquakes and 
there was a lot of trauma to the people from the earthquakes. Um, I think it was in 2012. Um, yeah. I might be. It's been a while. Um, people's nervous systems couldn't, they couldn't receive touch. And so he started working with different ways to be able to help them still find um, relaxation and better organization in their bodies without having to physically touch them, but where his field and the person's field were in relationship with one another. And what he found was that there is a place of ease where when you're standing in relationship with that other being, you can breathe, which is like, it's your breath feels so good. You feel grounded. It feels easy to be in your body. Um, and he talks about connecting to your hara or your belly um, or your intuition and how like, it's like, you know, like they talk about the gut brain or trusting your gut. And this just takes it to a whole nother level. <laughs> um, and you can do an entire session by just finding the place, by continuing to find the place of ease, hanging out there, the horse will process, and then you find the new place of ease. Um, so if you have a horse that has a lot of trauma and they can't be, they're not willing, to, they don't want to be touched yet, this is a great way to start showing them that interaction with you is safe and that it feels good. Um, and it's a, while you're in this space, it's a great place to expand your perception and already get an idea of what's going on for the horse, what patterns are showing up. Um, you want to be as relaxed as you can. Um, the more relaxed you are in your body, the more the horse will start to entrain and um, follow suit. Um, so what does that mean? What does it look like? <laughs> so basically, and I'll explain how to um, try this with your horses, but I'll also explain how to do this with a, a partner if you want to experience it with a person the fun of experiencing it with a person is like then you can have this dialogue and feedback and so you're not like in your head thinking like did I really feel that <laughs> um, but basically uh, you want to just gently walk around the horse's space when we're working with the horses make sure you're in a place that's safe you know like not standing behind them or you know in an area where it wouldn't be safe to to stand and you just want to see, okay, what does it feel like to be here? Does it feel like I can breathe easy? Does it feel like it's, um, like, does it feel really stagnant in this area? Does it feel like it's welcoming? There's going to be a different sensation and it'll take a little bit of fine tuning. Um, but I, I promise it's simple. <laughs> and once you find that place and there might be more than one spot, that's okay. You just pick, you know, whichever one you feel like you want to hang out with. Um, a lot of times there will be one that's the most potent and you'll see the horse start to take more gentle breaths. Like they're going to start engaging with you when you're in that spot. Um, they'll start to relax in their body. All the, the relaxation pieces we talked about during an unwinding will start to um, show up. So eyes closing, softening their posture, lengthening over the top line, dropping down, they're gelding. <laughs> um, and then you just hang out there and breathe. It's that simple. <laughs> um, and I maybe stood there for five minutes with him and the yawn, I mean, like the, the picture on the right is the, the result <laughs> of this. Um, and he, I had really bad timing because I thought they had already fed dinner. <laughs> so he didn't really want, he was like, are you sure we need to be doing this right now? <laughs> um, but once I like found the place to be easy, he was like, oh, okay, I still want to go eat my dinner, but oh, okay, I'll hang out with you. <laughs> um, so it's very, very powerful and so simple. And it's just, it's a really beautiful gift of, um, we can give ourselves and the horses because it gives us a chance to just be with them. Um, and it's a great way to start rapport, to start the session, because they're already going to be in a more relaxed place. <clears throat> it also is a way to, while you're hanging out in that space, you can kind of start to see like where you might want to um, touch for the first time. Um, Cause if you look at them with soft eyes, certain areas will just start to kind of jump out at you. At least that's my um, perspective. And I, I'm going to give you more guidance on that in the next couple slides as well. So um, if you want to do this with a partner, um, have two people, two people, 
and be know who's going to be the person that's moving and who's going to be the stationary person. You want to make sure you have a good sense of what you feel like on your own before you guys come in relationship to one another. Um, also be very respectful of each other's energy. So if someone said like, you know, like how far you can stand to one another. <laughs> um, and that will be part of it too, is like, you may find that the horse wants you to stand a little closer or a little further apart. So play with that. Also the angle or the, the vector of how your body is turned towards the horse can change things as well. Um, so, but what the person will do is you'll have a person in the middle. Well, I have this with my son Crystal here. We'll use that the person in the middle. <laughs> um, and then the other person will walk around. And with a person, you can walk behind them because they're not going to kick you, hopefully. <laughs> but um, you walk around and just see where does it feel really good in your body to stand in relationship to that person and then get feedback from the person in the center. Like, so what does that feel like in your body? And most likely you're going to find a spot where both you the person that's walking and the person in the center feel lots of ease um, and then just hang out there and see what happens. So that's the place of ease. <laughs> so Hopefully I, that was clear. <laughs> yeah. And I think what you're trying to describe here is ways that people can increase their sensitivity and their ability to feel. And, yes. that, and these exercises are really important regardless of what technique you might be going to use with your horse. Yes. So these are really nice kind of grounding exercises, exercises where we can tune in, where we can let our day go and just begin to open that perception like in that video you showed us. Yes. Hi, there's the other one. <laughs> open the perception so that what, it, because some, some people are asking like, what's the difference between, they're a little confused about the difference between Rolfing, T-Touch, Feldenkrais, Mary de Bono's work. But oh, I, totally. Well, but I would think one of the things that I want to bring this up is you're, you're actually kind of going beyond the technique itself, more into sort of the, um, uh, what's the word for it? Um, the, like the archetypal patterns that all of these techniques require. Exactly. And that's why I wanted to do, to share this with, because it doesn't matter what type of body work you're doing or what you're doing with the horse in general, all the, I wanted to give you something that you could do regardless. Right. As, no. a, as an exercise that we can do to help build our awareness, build our sensitivity, uh, build our perception, build our sense of ease, because that is so prerequisite to any technique that you're going to do. Yeah. And it's, it's so interesting because I've been around a lot of different ones, but you can see when somebody's trying to learn something and they're kind of pokey <laughs> because they're really thinking, okay, where do I put my hand and how do I move my hand? It's cerebral. <laughs> yeah. But what you're talking about here is, you, um, Quite simply, if you get into the right space, it doesn't really so much matter the technique as much as the intention. Exactly. It's the intentionality and coming from a place of love and being present and keeping it it's simple and less about doing and more about being. Right. And then any technique you're going to use, and, and while we're not really specifically talking about Rolfing at this point, Rolfing is from the basis of Ida Rolf, where she was looking mm -hmm. at fascia and looking at structural mm -hmm. integration. Um, and so um, it, it does seem that when we start to get into these uh, more generalized concepts that they all, and it just doesn't seem, it is, yeah. they all come from the same base. Mm -hmm. And then I usually talk to people and say, you know, what's the flavor? Do you, is it that you like yoga or that you like, are you drawn to Alexander? Or are you drawn yes. to Jonathan? Are you drawn to Feldenkrais? Because in the end, I think that we're, all these techniques are really touching on this, the same thing. It's like, it's all ice cream. Some yep. like, like Rocky Road versus, you know, vanilla, but it's, fla we're looking at flavors, not uh, really great differences at this level. Exactly. And that's why I use the word medium for perception, because we are all engaging with this same medium. We're all engaging with the horse. We're all engaging with our humankind. We're all engaging with the planet. And so you can use, you know, you can use these principles regardless of what, yeah. your, you know, what type of body work it is or modality or, you know, and as, as uh, Barb just said, you know, intuition can lead you to the modality that's most comfortable at any given time. And that's yeah. so true because, you know, sometimes it's really important to switch modalities because you're looking through a slightly different focus. And I know that's been really important for me personally, mm -hmm. 
that each one has a bit of a specialty and yes, it kind of relates, but then sometimes you need a little more direction. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yep. And um, I'm going to take you all through the principles of structural integration from the lens of working from this place of ease throughout that. Um, so that we're still interlacing the, the raw thing or the structural integration piece of it or that lens. Think of it more as like a theory or a, just a way of perceiving from, I guess, or lens, um, but it can be applicable to any type of, of body work. And I was, I, my intention was to make it so that people could use this no matter what lens they're coming from. Yep. So, um, so yeah. Again, we've already talked about this a lot, but just touch is so important, making sure they feel safe. Um, it's a way to show reciprocity to the horses. You know, it's a way to give back to them um, to show that connection with a human can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we want to touch with intention. We want to touch with us coming in from a sense of love. If you go to contact your horse and just feel them, and then you feel yourself with love and like how much you like adore your horse and just like just love in its purest form and then go touch with them, it will feel totally different. So that's another fun experiment. <laughs> So, um, okay, so now we get into some of the guidelines or principles of raw construction migration. I just, SI is just a shortened version because it's a whole mouthful. <laughs> um, the overall principle is holism because it's not about fixing, it's about transformation. It's, you know, a different paradigm of, of healing, um, looking more at that transformational work. And so there are, four main principles and this next concept we're going to talk about yielding which is something that comes from Carol and Hero's work um, which you won't necessarily hear in the just traditional training um, helps support all of these principles so we can um, help facilitate these things in the horse's body through this uh, yielding work which I'm, I promise I'm going to explain. <laughs> um, so our first general principle is going to be this idea of support. Um, and then we have adaptability and then we have palantonicity and I'm going to go into the definitions and more in depth of each of these. And then we have closure and all of these principles can happen within a sh a one session or they can happen over a series. Um, it just kind of depends on, you know, you're going to have a level of them in each session, but like support may be more, because it's more um, of the initial principle, you may be working for support more um, in the initial sessions. And then as you do more, you get more into adaptability and palantonicity. You can kind of think of it like the training scale in riding of like how you have to have certain pieces in place before you can go to the next element. You have to have your foundation. Um, so again, holism being the overarching principle of all of them. Um, and I just wanted to share this quote from Dr. Ida Rolf. It's from one of her books that what we can do is to change the way the parts of the body fit together into a whole, which can transmit the gravitational field to the body in such a way that it enhances its energy field. You can change the body by virtue of the fact that it is segmented. And when you have changed it appropriately, gravity can flow through. And basically what that means is that when we have all these pieces and parts, and how can we help them be in relationship with one another better so that the forces of gravity can flow through more easily and we can find this nice graceful movement within gravity. She really liked gravity and her like, whole relation. Like, that was a big thing. Hey, look, it's the law. <laughs> <laughs> I'm big on gravity. Yep. <laughs> I, I offend, uh, occasionally feel like I'm waging a little bit of war with gravity, but I guess we all go through uh, well, moments of that. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, I have a, a likeness for it. <laughs> um, so our first principle is going to be the principle of support. And what we're looking for is, can this horse ground in their body? Is their center of gravity in a place that allows them to move in a dynamic way? You know, if, if a horse is sort of existing above their body, they're not going to be connected to it. They're going to, their center of gravity is going to be too high. Um, and they're more likely to 
injure themselves because they're not aware of where their limbs are. Um, are they resting into their feet comfortably? So highly recommend checking out the webinars around feet because feet are so important. And the cool thing is feet can change. Yep. <laughs> and um, through fascial work, we can change the feet quite a bit um, in support with the farriers. So it's just really, um, it's, it's a really dynamic part of the body, even though it seems like it might be more static. Um, are they standing on all four feet the same in the sense that like, are, like in yoga that talk about, are you standing on the four corners of your feet? It's kind of the same thing. Like, do they have a good foundation underneath them? Um, does it look like they have, with that good foundation, can they then find lift from it? Or is the horse trying to hold themselves up? Because if they don't have a good sense of support, they're going to be pulling themselves up versus resting into their body and then finding this nice elevation and lift. You'll see this a lot of times with horses who pull from their front end. They don't have a good sense of support in their body and they, therefore they can't engage their hind end to get that nice elevation and lift through the thoracic sling. Um, let's see. Again, are they able to yield into their body, which we're going to talk about next. <laughs> um, I believe that's it. Get, when you see a horse that feels supported in their body, they look really strong. They look really sturdy. And it's not, it's not a strength thing. It's just like they're energetically in, I mean, strength can help, but they're energetically in their body. Um, and you feel like they're resourced, like they have a place to, to work from so that we can then ask them to do other things. So um, and anytime we're observing the horses, uh, like Carol mentioned in the video, we want to do it with peripheral vision and soft eyes, because if we're looking too closely, like we're not going to see anything. <laughs> or we're just going to see the tiny little thing, the area that we're focusing on. Um, okay, so finally to the art of yielding, <laughs> we've been alluding to. Um, so it's the first developmental movement in, in our bodies. Um, and what I mean by that is when um, the embryo is being developed, it is literally an action of yielding into the body. Um, and so what they've found through embryology is that this idea of yielding is this first movement that really helps inform all other movements. Um, and this, the quote I have here from Hero is, it's the first developmental movement often misunderstood as a passive surrendering or a doing nothing. It is in fact an active coming into relationship and it's the fundamental movement behavior that underlies all others. So there's still tone to it. It's not just about being like fully flaccid. <laughs> um, and it's a way of releasing weight into gravity. And out of this, we can find lift. So again, it comes back to that idea of support for them, which we can find lift. Um, it allows them to reclaim areas impacted by trauma. And when you see the, the pictures of this, I'll, you'll be able to understand this better, I think. And the reason why it helps create support and a foundation for, in this, um, example of a horse is because we're literally giving a place for the cells of the body to feel like they can rest and become spacious and then we can like build on top of that so it's like if you think of you're building a building we're creating the foundation so that we can then expand upon it um and it's creating a place so the cells feel like they um can move so the intention is to facilitate a dynamic posture um, so it's a, I'm showing this through pictures because I think it's showing it through video would be a little bit tricky. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what you'll do is like in the place of ease, you want to be super relaxed in your body, um, because the relaxation of your body is helping inform the cells. And we're using the back of the hand because it's a more neutral way to contact the horse but also it provides a nice surface for the horse to rest um, into your hand. And it's not like they're, it's, it's not like they're gonna like just collapse into it. You'll just feel like their whole body start to expand into your hand. Um, so what you'll do is a lot of times it's along the midline and you'll see areas where they're 
more lifted up out of their body. Um, so like the reason why I went to um, right behind Hawkeye's elbow was because at his sternum, he was kind of bracing up through his sternum. And so by bringing my hand um, behind the sternum and a little bit on his belly, he can then expand into my hand and refill that space. So a lot of times it's gonna be on the underline of the body. So under the neck, um, the sternum, along the belly. Um, a lot of times it will also be um, the back of the front legs and the front of the back legs. <laughs> <laughs> but really it's just it's very free form it's going to be dependent on the horse and what you'll look for is areas that are drawn up that aren't fully resting that's kind of how you know where to put your hands um and so what happens is they will literally start yielding into your hand you'll they'll feel heavier they'll take up more space um as you can see in the middle picture hawkeye starting to to rest that entire side of his body um, into my right hand. Um, and you'll also notice them starting to downregulate. They'll go into uh, those relaxation um, signals as well. So does anyone have any questions or clarifications? I know this is kind of a hard thing to describe through pictures. <laughs> yeah, no, I think uh, people are doing pretty good. Um, okay. <laughs> and just as a side note, I just checked my battery. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll We'll just try to go quickly. <laughs> well, no, I can go get my, I can go plug it in. So, um, I think we're, I think we're doing okay, actually. So, okay. <laughs> so if you need to go get it, you let me know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I should get a warning, but I was just like, oh, well, um, uh, it's, I should see. It's not, it's, oh, okay. it's, that's what I want to know. Oh, I'm good. Okay. We're good. Okay. Um, and then I also wanted to emphasize that you don't necessarily have to directly touch the horse. You can work in the space below the horse. Um, so in this picture, this horse had a really tight throat. It was very closed off. Um, and so by placing the hand underneath, I'm still, and being relaxed in my body, it's giving the horse input to start letting their throat open towards my hand. Um, and so the pole relaxes, the TMJ relaxes, the highway tends to relax. They'll get this nice lengthening through the lower part of the neck and more space to the throat. So this is just one example of how to utilize this way of connecting with the horse. Um, another way to do it is that I could have started by touching right underneath the throat and then gently brought my hand away to kind of, you'll find that the horse will start to follow your hand. And it's almost like there's like energetic taffy between your hand and the horse. And they're just like, oh, thank you for like inviting me into this space. Um, so it's very gentle, very subtle, but very impactful. Do you uh, somebody's asked if you find a difference with the surface you're working on, say, um, you know, gravel versus concrete versus an arena? Um, sometimes you you want the horse to feel comfortable in whatever footing you're working with. Um, I try to always just work where the horse feels the, the safest um, so that they, you know, it's, a, it's something that they're, they're it, the footing itself is not alarming to them. Right. If it's not something that they, they're used to that, you know, um, it can be a little bit trickier. But with that said, if you do the place of ease work first, and then you go into this yielding space, the yielding actually helps them have a better relationship with the ground. So it can also be a way of getting them used to new surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, so, or getting them used to surefoot pads, <laughs> um, which is what we come to next. <laughs> okay. And then somebody else, uh, Julie, oh. Julie Hunter has made a comment that these are the same principles or, or are, are so metaphorically present in human counseling. Yes, yeah, I mean, it trans it goes across all things, like, which I just love. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, I, I, I think what you're really talking about tonight are these underlying archetypal concepts that mm -hmm. just, you know, that is who we are as beings. Yep. yep. Yeah. And just so how do we engage with that and enhance it within, you know, our experience of life and our horse's experience? Yeah. So, um, so I find that the surefoot pads are so helpful for this idea of yielding. One, just using them in general 
because it gives the horse a new sense of the space underneath their, um, their, their hoof so that they can expand. Um, when I would work with people, I could put my hands underneath the horse's foot, but I can't do that with a horse. I mean, I mean, it's a person's foot, mm -hmm. not a horse's, sorry. But with a horse, I can't do that same thing. What I can do is work with the space around a horse's hoof, which if you guys watched Rachel's um, webinar, you, I, I'm the one in the hat. You can't actually see my face ever in any of the pictures, but I'm the one working on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a lot of different ways to use this and for tonight's sake, I'm just keeping it simplified, yeah. um, at least as simplified as I can. And, but the pads are a great way to engage with this idea of yielding into a space. Um, and so one, just the regular um, flat ones, but I, I absolutely love the slants for this yeah. because if we have a horse that needs to figure out how to find the length through a space, um, the, the slants can help us do that. Um, so in these examples here, this horse wasn't finding the full weight in the lateral part of the, the lateral line of, of their hind leg. And so by creating um, some support with the pads, she was able to yield into this space and be like, oh, that's my lateral line. And I can fully expand into that now. Um, and it doesn't take very much input. I've seen horses just barely touch the tip and they have this whole new organization because it just gave them enough input to be like, oh, that's, a sense, that's an experience I haven't you know, had for a while or ever had. Um, and with the wedge or the slants, when there's a torsion happening, we can just slightly shift the pad as ne needed to help unwind a torsion, mm -hmm. um, which is super fun. Yeah. So that's just a way to use the pads for yielding. I think anytime they're on the pads, they're in a place of yielding. <laughs> um, and that's part of the reason why we see that oscillation and that, um, that mobility of the swaying and everything. Cause they're like, okay, I'm having a new sense of my foundation. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the next principle is going to be adaptability. So this is when the horse starts to have like an increased responsiveness in their body. They're able to move a little more laterally in their body comfortably and from a supported place. Um, they can like, they have more of a sense of the container of their whole body. Um, and they can move in a little bit more multidimensional way. This is, uh, comes back to the idea of turning the lights back on in areas. Um, because we have big sections where that's missing, they're not gonna have adaptability through that area because they can't expand or feel into that space. So again, looking at the horse with soft eyes and how to find a place that needs more adaptability is it will, with soft eyes, it'll look less vital. It will look like, it'll literally look duller. Um, it won't be as full as other places. And it just won't, like, if you look at it from an energetic standpoint, it will um, be less present. So. so for adaptability, same idea of using the back of the hand. But what you do is you contact the horse with the back of the hand in that place that you found where you wanted to bring some vitality back. And you just kind of hang out there. And you almost imagine, like, you're, you're bringing the hand away. Because, again, you're inviting the tissue to come out into the space. Um, you don't have to take your hand away. You can just imagine that you are, but it's really fun to kind of pull away and have that energetic happy as well. Cause it's just, it, they're like, Oh, that is so cool. And usually they'll take a big deep breath as they fill into the space. Um, and you can do this anywhere. It can apply to anywhere on the body. I just chose a big broad region so that it was easier for you guys to see what I was doing there. So any questions about that piece or does everyone feel, feel good with that? Yeah, no, I think they're good. Okay, cool. So again, it's, we want spaciousness so that the cells have more room to vibrate and be vital. So that's what this is helping with. And again, it will allow the horse to be more adaptable. We start getting more of those, um, more ranges of motion, essentially. And then palatonicity, which is like one of my favorite words. <laughs> um, it's a really fancy way of essentially saying that it can move in, um, an oppositional way like you can lengthen through the pole as well as flex and engage through the hind end as far as the horse goes so i chose the rainbow because we have a horse that's truly in um proper 
use of their top line and in collection, they have this amazing arcing rainbow shape where the back end will be a lower um, end of the rainbow <laughs> and the top end will actually lift higher up. Um, and that's palantonicity. They can move in multi directions at the same time. So, um, and how we achieve this is by helping them find decompression through their body. Um, so a simple way to work with that is to rest one after you've done the other pieces, the place of ease, the yielding, um, giving them space for the adaptability, is you can place your hands um, on the withers and sacrum or wherever your hands are really called along the top line and just hang out there and breathe with them. And you'll start to feel the, um, the more you get in tune with it, you will start to feel the, the cranial rhythm um, at play here. And this gives them that awareness that their spine can lengthen forward as it lengthens back. So from an anatomy standpoint, we know that the, um, the spinous processes on the cervical spine are facing a, a little bit towards the back of the horse and the spinous processes on the um, uh, behind T16 are a little bit more towards the head. So they're a little bit like this. And as they get expand, they go like this. Um, if you have a chance to study with, study with or watch Jillian's talk, um, she does a whole demo with that that explains it in a much more in-depth way, but that's like the simplified version that as they lengthen over their top line, the vertebra gets spacious. <laughs> so, um, so that's what we're helping with here. In August, actually. Huh? Jillian will be back with us in August. Beautiful. Yeah, she's a wealth of knowledge. So yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to get to hang out with her in the, in the next couple months. So, <laughs> um, highly recommend her courses and all of that. Um, so yeah, so that's palantonicity and it's, I think it's a little bit, it's one of the harder things for us to accomplish in a more sustained way with the horses just because of all the things that we're dealing with as far as saddle fit, dentistry, teeth balance, rider balance, nutrition, you know, there's all these components and I feel like this is the one that we have to work a little bit, all those components have to come together a little bit more to be able to fully express, so. Um, and my horse is a total bodywork junkie, so if you just touch him, he like goes into, <laughs> into the space. <laughs> um, and then closure. So it's about knowing when the horse is done for part of that, but you know, just that could, it can also be closure within a connection. So that's how we know when to like take our hands off for a moment and let the horse process it can be a moment of closure. Um, or it could be, okay, when when are they done in the session that we've, we're leaving them in a place that's very integrated, that they can then go out in the world and explore it and feel really, really secure in their body. Um, and I, <laughs> I love this analogy with the souffle <laughs> because this idea of like, we don't want the souffle to fall. <laughs> um, so you want to be tracking what the horse is going through um, to make sure that we're not overdoing it. You, less is always going to be more in um when it comes to the integration and that would be said for you know working with the pads as well if you want to track where are they staying integrated while they're on the pads or have they gone past a place where it's now no longer serving their highest good right so. um and somebody's asked if they might walk off or walk away and i'm i'm sure that that's one of the possible responses yeah and sometimes they'll walk away for just a moment and then they'll come back to you you kind of have to check in and see, okay, is the walking away mean like they're completely done or does it just mean they need a moment? Because sometimes it just means they need a moment. So I find a lot of times- Owning cats really helps us figure out that one. What did you say? That owning cats. When cats yes. are done, cats are done. You know, there's yes. it's black and white. There is no gray. <laughs> no, there's, there's no gray. Um, and speaking of cats, <laughs> oh, does someone have a question? I saw the thing blink. Nope, just somebody saying amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so speaking of cats, this applies to all of our other animal friends. I've, I've worked with a variety of different um, animals and the principles are the same regardless. It's honoring the animal, showing up, being present, and um, just really listening. So um, I worked with a duck here. We have a pig. We've got some fabulous dogs, cow a totally blissed out cat. 
and um, a donkey. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, just deep gratitude to all my teachers, especially the horses. And thank you for joining me tonight. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to clarify anything. <laughs> Uh, well, you've got a big thank you here. Um, it just uh, go ahead and unshare your screen and then we can. Okay. Let's see. No, I think this has been, uh, you know, all the webinars are so different and they all tie together in many ways, but this is really awesome because you've given people really things that they can go out and do and actually experiment with. And while, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of comments about, you know, is it similar to Masterson or De Bono or, but but I think what you're really getting to is the essence of all the techniques. Exactly. Which, you know, regardless of how you actually do the technical part or where you put your hand or what, you know, you're focusing on, it's the presence that we need when we're going to work with our animals in any way that's going to make that connection for healing. Mm -hmm. um, I really feel like that's really the power of your, uh, I, of your talk tonight is, you know, how do we get to the essence? <laughs> oh, it's great. I, Thank it's you. Fun. Yeah, I just my lens is as a rolfer and a cranial practitioner. That's so that's just the lens I come from. But I want everyone to know that even if you have no training, no background, you can be in relationship with your horse in a way that facilitates well-being for them. I mean, just by breathing next to them, you help things feel better. <laughs> so. yeah, I think, or just using the back of your hand that you. You know, yes, it's nice to have all these techniques and you can still make a difference without them just mm -hmm. by being present and simple. Yeah, keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I, you know, one of the things for me with the Surefoot Pads that was so important is that it was simple, right? Yes, yes. So that people, and people still feel intimidated. Biggest question I get is which pad should I buy? Um, tomorrow, it's my Surefoot webinar, so you can join me for that and we can talk about that. But, you yeah. know, it's simple, just, just you know. Um, and that was one of the things that's so powerful. Yeah, and be okay with playing and being kind to yourself because like it's all play. It's just it's exploration. It's you know it's it's just seeing like trying something on and seeing okay does this resonate? Does it work for us? And if not, be okay with just like like yeah, we gotta go move on. Exactly. <laughs> so well, Lauren, thank you so much for being my thank guest. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us. It's been another really interesting journey and a, a little longer than planned, but that's okay. You will find this in all the webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. You'll be able to watch them at your leisure, replay them, you know, go back and see something again or stop and connect with another webinar. And that's really what I'm trying to do here is create a library of information for everybody to access whenever they choose. It's a beautiful thing you're doing. I'm so grateful for it. And thank you for everyone that's participating. Yeah, no, it's really fun. And it just, it is, it, it is a family of participation here and everybody's been so incredibly generous with their time. So thank you, Lauren, so much for joining. Thank you. <laughs> and um, we'll see y'all tomorrow. My webinars at one o'clock. We'll be talking about using Surefoot pads and everybody have a great night. Yes. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.